Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, this morning. We're starting a little late. Um, welcome to our service today. Back at the start of May, we, um, I did what I thought would be a one-off sermon on Proverbs, um, but um, as we did that, I thought, well, there's actually lots more to, to do here. So we've, uh, we've come back to some of its themes, and today we're going to be looking at the theme of friendship. And today we also have, it's the second Sunday, it's the week of our church lunch, and today is going to be a barbecue. Everyone's very welcome to stay for that. And then after that barbecue, we have a further time of, uh, of, of time together of Bible study. Uh, we're looking at the, the end of Colossians, uh, the penultimate study in Colossians. And then just to say our meeting on Wednesday, we meet for prayer at 7.30. Uh, one of the things we're going to perhaps be looking at is the... Uh, Grace Baptist Mission, um, uh, their magazine, they've got a week of prayer this week. And uh, you could, if you haven't picked up one of these, there's some of these at the back, uh, a way we can pray for different mission around the world. And for other things to pray for, do look at our monthly bulletin uh, that's been sent out by email. This paper copy is there on the table at the back. Well, these are some incredible words of Jesus. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Two incredible things here. One, Jesus did exactly this just hours after saying this. This wasn't just some nice talk. This is actually what Jesus then did just hours later. But in some ways, what's even more amazing is that he was calling his disciples, people um, who had let him down and were about to let him down even more, people who were sinners, he called them his friends. And that is what is so incredible about the gospel. We are brought near to God through Christ that he calls us his friends. And that's why we're going to sing this first uh, hymn this morning, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Sins and Griefs to Bear. Let's stand and sing. Well, after singing that, we need to pray, don't we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can pray this morning. And it's not simply about us opening our mouths. The incredible thing is that you want to hear our voice. You even delight to hear our voice. You are more ready to hear than we are to pray. 
And we thank you that, it's, that that is true because we pray in the mouth of Jesus, because we are bound to him. As your children, we can call you our Father. And we thank you for that incredible closeness, that uh, bond that is unbreakable. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we are just astonished this morning that as well as being your children, we can also be called your friends. That Jesus called his friends people who are by nature enemies. It is while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. And even still, we are sinners. Lord, every day we sin. Every day we offend you. We displease you. We grieve you. And yet, your love conquers that sin because of what Christ has done. We can come to you and ask for fresh forgiveness of sin because of what Christ has done. We can be confident that you will not leave us because of that promise of Christ. It is through his death that we have become friends. And we pray, Lord, that as we, we look at Jesus and see what his friendship is like, help us to see how, uh, how rubbish we are at the same thing. Help us to compare ourselves not to others around us, but to Jesus. As we look at him, look at how he listened to people. Look at how he cared for their interests, not his own. Look at his honesty, his willingness to say what is true, even when that is uncomfortable. For his promise to be with his people to the very end of the age. We are not like that, but we thank you that we have a saviour who is. And we pray, Lord, that we would, in the first, first place, go to him for our friendship. Our, our human friends will let us down. That is never going to be where our ultimate hope and, and help is found. Although we, we, we thank you for the great gift of friendship, we pray, Lord, that we would go to Jesus, that we would find him to be a friend closer than a brother. Maybe we feel very alone this morning. Maybe we feel, well, actually, we don't really have any friends. We pray, Lord, that we would cast our cares upon Jesus, that we would see his goodness, his care, that we would rely upon him, find our comfort and our strength. And as we do that, help us to then befriend others. Maybe we don't have friends but maybe we can be a friend to someone else. And we pray that that would be our heart, that would be what characterizes this church, that we would have friendships that reflect the friendship of Jesus. Heavenly Father, deal with us in our need today. Break down the, um, the sort of pride in us where we sort of think we're good at things that actually we're rubbish at. Pray that we would be teachable, and we pray that we would truly find in Jesus that great friend. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Okay, well, children's talks are sometimes predictable. Um, sometimes you can see where they're going or you've heard them before. Uh, I can guarantee that isn't going to be the case this morning. You're going to be hearing things that only a handful of people in the world know about. And I'm very grateful to someone who's uh, recently become a friend, a guy called James Bijon of uh, Tyndale House in Cambridge, who's let me borrow all his slides. So we're going to talk about Iron Man, okay? But not this one. Okay, the real Iron Man came a long time before this film, and we find him here in 1 Samuel. When David came to Mahanaim, Sobi, son of Nahash, from Rabbah of the Ammonites, and Machir, son of Amiel, from Lodabar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite, from Rogalim, brought bedding and bowls and articles of pottery. They also brought wheat and barley, flour and roasted grain, beans and lentils, honey and curd, sheep and cheese from cow's milk for David and his people to eat. For they said, the people have become hungry and tired 
and thirsty in the desert. So, the Iron Man, and I'll explain that in a moment, is Barzillai, the Gileadite from Rogalim, and he comes up again later on um, in the same, uh, a bit further on in the account. And, and the context here is David, King David, is fleeing Jerusalem. His life is in danger, really largely due to his own fault, from his own failures, actually, is the reason he's in this mess. But Barzillai and these others are a friend to him at this time. So how do you, how, how do you think Barzillai is being a friend here to, uh, to David? What, what was he doing that was showing he was a friend? What did they, what did they do? Feed him. Yeah, they brought, they brought all sorts of things, actually. I mean, it's just not just that they brought a bit of bread. I mean, bedding, bowls, pottery, wheat, barley, all sorts of different food. I mean, this was, this was quite impressive, and it was for loads of people, too. So it was, it was a very generous act. He was someone who showed that he cared. But my question this morning is, was Barzillai an imaginary friend? Lots of people create imaginary friends. That's quite a common thing. And what I mean by this, was that, is he just someone made up in this story? That, um, you know, someone, someone wrote all this down hundreds of years after the event and sort of made up this person, Barzilla. Because that's what lots of people say the Bible is. It's just stuff made up ages later. It's just all, it, it's, 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 just, it's just a story that's made up. Well, when you're telling us if you're trying to make up a story, one of the things that's really difficult to do is to get the names right. If you're trying to write a story about what happened in another country or another place, another time, because names change, don't they, in different places, different parts of the world, people have different names. Names change over time. What are popular names today were not popular names 30 or even 40 years ago. And we thought a bit about this some weeks ago, thinking about names in the New Testament and showing that the names that we find in the New Testament match exactly what were the common names in that part of Israel at that, or that part of the world at that time. So we're sort of doing the same thing here with an Old Testament name. And the name Barzillai means Iron Man. Okay, that's what the name means. And there are actually other people in the Bible who have names related to metals. I never knew this. Job's friends, okay, friend theme here. Eliphaz, name related to gold, Zophar, meaning copper. So you have, you have names related to metals, but Barzillai is unusual as Iron Man. So where did the name come from? Is this just made up? Well, we were told in that account that he comes from Rogalim, and that's basically where that arrow is on the diagram. And what do you find in Rogalim, near Rogalim? Well, you're not going to be able to read all of this, but um, it's listing where you find different minerals in um, different parts of Israel. And basically, there's a whole load of stars where, near where Rogalim is, where you've got iron, where you mine iron. Okay? So it's from a place where you mine lots of iron. And there's not a lot of other places that have iron. There's some right down in the south near Egypt, but only up there in the north. Actually, it links as well with Og, king of Bashan, who lived in that part of the world, who had an iron bed. Is also, anyway, that, that's, that's another story. But um, So he's from a place where you get iron. Now, I said that, that the names, uh, th that he had an unusual name. Well, often names, you have a name that, that appears in different languages. The name Peter, for example... Uh, in, f in France, you'd be called Pierre. In Spain, you'd be called Pedro. They're all, they're all sort of the same name. But you don't get that with Barzillai, except in one language, a language called Sapphitic, which is what they would use in um, this part of the uh, sort of east of, uh, yeah, east of the Jordan, Transjordan area, and this is what it looks like in the Transjordan area. It looks a bit like Mars, doesn't it? You've got iron in these rocks. But what's interesting about these rocks is you've got graffiti on them. 
See, graffiti is a great thing. It means you can start to see what people said and thought and what names people had back in the past. You know, just as people write, you know, Stephen was here on a bridge or something, well, people were writing on rocks in that time. So you can see some of the, uh, the uh, artwork on these rocks. And um, have a look at this one. My Sakaitic's a bit rusty, so I've got a bit of help here. Um, but that's identifying the letters for us. Those letters in Sakaitic correspond to the English letters B, R, Z, and L. It's this same name, Barzillai. Uh, you know, Barzillai was here. And uh, you get it on lots of these rocks. In other words, his name fits this local setting that you don't find anywhere else. The Bible is not made up. It's talking about real people in the real world. You know, the Bible's not Narnia. It's not some separate world. No, it's our world with real people. Barzile existed. I'm sure we'll get to meet him in heaven. And his name fits exactly what you would expect. So people that say, oh, the Bible's all just, just made up, well, get some data is you actually get some facts. There's lots of evidence that shows that is actually not the case at all. Barzillai was a very real person from a very real place. And I guess perhaps the lesson for us is this, that remember another real person in the Bible, Jesus. He's not an imaginary friend either. Sometimes people say, oh, you just, you know, this, this Jesus thing, it's just made up to help you feel better. Nonsense. He's a real person. He's not an imaginary friend. And he did even more than what Barzillai did. He forgives sin and gives us eternal life. And that's what we're going to sing about in this next song. Jesus gives life, life to the full, a friendship with God that nothing can sever. So even if you missed the start, you know the theme for today. Let's stand and sing. Down, um, apart from Victor, who um, is going to hopefully not remind you because you know about this already. But anyway. Yes, it is the regatta taking place in less than two weeks' time, Saturday the 24th of June. It's a fantastic opportunity for us to have an outreach to share Jesus Christ with the local people of Gravesend ask life's biggest questions and cause them to ponder on what is <coughs> true life. Um, so we will be having an open air event. Um, we would like for everyone, as many of us as possible, to be out there arriving from 1 p.m. looking for a 1.30 start. And um, we'll have a series of different people talking, presenting the gospel visually, um, sharing their testimonies. Um, we'll be interviewing people answering them questions about their beliefs as well. Um, but we're still looking for more people to get involved. So if you would like to be involved um, in one way or another, um, whether it's sharing a testimony, um, sharing a life experience, how you became a Christian, why you believe that Jesus Christ is real, please do come and speak to me. Um, particularly, we'd like people to be there to help give out leaflets. So we've now got uh, a fresh batch of our Hope Ready leaflets, which you can help give out. Um, there'll be a bookstall as well that you can give to people as they pass by. 
but also be ready to engage people, um, ask them questions, allow them to ask you questions as well. Um, so that's going to be at Grays and Riverside Leisure Area. We'll have a store, a stand, just by the Promenade Cafe. Um, you won't be able to miss us. Um, thank you to everyone that's been involved so far. We'll be hearing um, a talk from Simon and Liv. From, um, Simon, sorry, Sam and Liv. <laughs> Simon, <laughs> myself, um, Chica will be sharing the testimony as well, Julian, um, and so he will be interviewed. I'll be asking him some questions. Um, but if you'd like to be involved, please, please do speak to me after the service. Um, thank you as well to Daniel offering to help out with um, carrying things, as well as Martin and Alistair as well. Um, but please do pray. Pray that people will t uh, attend. Pray for good weather. Pray that people will listen attentively. Pray that people will believe what they're hearing. Um, pray that they will come to the church or any Bible-believing, gospel-preaching shops. Thank you very much. Yeah, just being there um, and not even opening your mouth will be a massive help. Just having bodies present there helps to draw a crowd. So if you feel you can't do anything else, well, if you're able to stand or sit, then you're the person we need, okay? Um, especially if you turn up on time, yeah. Um, right, let's pray. And we're going to pray for, um, for the regatta, but also our, our friends in Bordeaux, uh, and the ministry there. Um, there was a little update um, Simon shared in the, 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 uh, the email that went out this week, um, which I'm sure you've all read, um, so you'll know what I'm praying about. If you don't, then go back and read it later. Uh, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we would echo the prayers of the Apostle Paul, who asked for an open door for the message. He asked that he and ourselves would be able to proclaim that message clearly. And if the Apostle Paul needed to pray that, how much more do we? And we do so thank you for the opportunity you have opened. But Lord, we ask that you would have an open door into the much harder thing, into people's hearts. It's one thing, and it's an, a great thing to have the opportunity to be able to, to be out there in the public, to be talking about the Lord Jesus. But we pray that those would not be idle words, that all that is said and done would draw people to yourself. We do pray you would overrule the, 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 the practical arrangements. Pray, Father, for all the things that can cause hiccups, uh, just like sorting out the slides this morning and all these other things that can get, um, can cause all these problems. We pray, Lord, against such things. We pray, Lord, for the weather. We pray, Father, for dry weather. And we pray for those who are preparing to, to lead and speak in different ways. Give them your wisdom, your insight, your words. And Lord, we also would pray that you would open a door in France, in Bordeaux, we do thank you for Maxim and Demelza. Thank you for sending them to that work. Thank you for all that has been done. Thank you for all the inroads they have into that town, into the student community. But our prayer is that you would not, that there would not just be lots of contacts and opportunities. We pray, Father, for a church to be established, a body of Christ to be, um, to be thriving in that place living out what it means to, to be a Christian. We pray, Lord, help the, the group that, uh, that meets on a Sunday. Help them as they study Romans. We pray that they would be, yes, instructed in the truth, but they would be drawn closer to you through that, that they would have a greater help and boldness to be able to speak to Jesus to those around us. And we pray, lead them forward as a church. Help them as a family. Protect them, we pray. Help them with uh, the, new, um, the new baby. And we pray, Lord, establish your work in that place. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's come now to uh, our reading uh, from Scripture. We're going to read about uh, another friendship. And uh, this was... Before, the bit we did before with Barzillai was, was after David was king. This is now before David is king and the time where he is in need 
earlier in his life, and it's talking about Jonathan, who is the son of the person who was king at that time, King Saul. So Jonathan, when Saul died, would become king, except he knew that that wasn't God's plan, and he was ready to accept that, and in fact, David was his closest friend. So let's read about that now in 1 Samuel 18. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. And then we turn over to chapter 20. Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to take my life? Never, Jonathan replied. You are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without confiding in me. Why should he hide this from me? It is not so. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favour in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this, or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. So David said, Look, tomorrow is the new moon festival, and I'm supposed to dine with the king. But let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says, very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that that he is determined to harm me. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I'm guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never, Jonathan said. If I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David asked, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let us go out into the field. So they went there together. Then Jonathan said to David, by the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time, the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed towards you, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be be with you as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not cut off your kindness from my family not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. Well, let's sing once more, and this will be um, time to... for. For, to go up to junior church, um, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. So faithfulness in the friendship of Christ. Let's stand and sing. Oh 
Well, last month I came across uh, this new story. It said a top US health official has warned the country is facing an epidemic of loneliness that is as dangerous to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Uh, it says in order to tackle this, Mr. Murphy has called for a collective effort to mend the social fabric of our nation. We need pro-connection public policies, is what he said. It's odd, isn't it? Pro-connection public policies. We are the most connected generation in history. You can message anyone, anywhere, and have a worldwide audience for your thoughts. And yet he's right, because studies show, actually, the loneliest group in our society today is not the elderly. It's the young people, the people who are the most digitally connected. Increasingly, we can conduct life without ever having to interact with real people. A lot of education is now online. You shop online. If you go to a supermarket, you go to a self-checkout. If you phone for customer service, you're faced with a computer. And uh, I must admit, all these claims about AI, if AI is so good, why is it so bad at answering phone calls? You know, why is it so incapable of actually answering the question I have about my tax return or whatever it is? You know, um, I, I, yeah, anyway, yeah. You know what it's like. Um, computer says no. There's, it's not one of the options. And it's not that technology is, is inherently bad. There are many benefits. There are good things about the, these things. But it's never cost-free. If you remember that New Year sermon, you can't have your cake and eat it. We can't bend and create reality to suit ourselves because we live in God's universe. And therefore, we need God's wisdom to know how to live in his universe. And we need help with something as basic and simple, you would have thought, as friendship. We're all, we all know about friendship. We, we, we can sort that out ourselves. Well, if so, we, that can't be the case. We, we must actually be a bit rubbish at it if we are so lonely. And the reality is the more that we have turned away from God's wisdom, we actually end up having to relearn the obvious 
as a society. I came across this um, advice to some secondary school kids recently, something that to me is, is obvious in God's universe, but somehow it clearly is not obvious today. They were told this, there is a strong link between kindness and anxiety. People who are kinder to others have a better self-esteem, which leads to improved confidence and less worries and anxiety. You see, we love to think that we are in an enlightened age, and yet people of the past understood this much better. Look what it says in Proverbs, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. It was all said 3,000 years ago and before. And yet, do you notice there's a difference in what Proverbs is saying to what that advice to the school kids was? Did you notice that the concern in that advice to the children was do this for how it benefits you? It will help your anxiety, your self-esteem. So even in showing kindness, it's actually all about yourself. It's about how you can be benefited from showing kindness to others. That's the opposite of what's going on there in Proverbs. You get the same thing in people like Jordan Peterson. You care about other people for how it benefits your own self-optimization. Again, it's a self-focus. There's an interest in other people, but it's an interest in other people for how they can help you. It's all self-focused. It's as if the universe is mine. Well, it's not. It's God's universe. And Proverbs is different. It is life in God's universe. And we sort of introduced this book at the start of May and uh, a little bit on how to read Proverbs, which I'm going to sort of assume here this morning. But just to say this, it's not self-help. What we're doing this morning is not five steps to better friendships. I'm not going to go through each proverb based on friendship today in, in detail because that's your job. That's the whole point. We're meant to go away and think on this ourselves. I wonder, are you applying what I said at the start of May? I said, spend a bit less time on your phone and instead go to God's Twitter page, the book of Proverbs. Have you actually done that? In, you've had five weeks, you know, a month has gone by. Have you actually done that? If not, you obviously don't think God's got much wisdom for your life. Or act, you think whatever you're reading on your phone or whatever has more wisdom than what God has said. It must be. Because if you didn't think that, you would have been reading it. And if you have been reading it, I hope that that has been something that you've been blessed by. So what I want to do this morning is look at what Proverbs assumes if you like, what it reveals about life in God's universe. Because you are someone made by God. And there is actually a little link to what we did last time about prosperity. Because Abraham, as we think about Abraham last time, Abraham is described as a friend of God. We'll come back to that at the end. So, what is friendship? Well, let me read these two Proverbs to you. 17 verse 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. And of course, the way Proverbs works, that means a friend is there for adversity as well. That's the whole point. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Whatever else you say about friendship, it is something precious. In many ways, it's not easy to define, but we all know it, don't we, when we see it? Or perhaps we know it, most of all, when we don't see it, when we miss it. Think of Job in his distress. He was looking for help and support and loyalty. And instead, he says he was a laughing stock to the people that were supposed to be his friends. Or think of David, <clears throat> what we read there about Jonathan. Jonathan shared David's heart. It was actually what they shared was a heart for God. And it was very costly for Jonathan. He put loyalty to David and to God's purpose above his own interests and future. He was a support in David's time of need, a time of loneliness for David. And then later in David's life, 
when he was in this mess of his own making, fleeing Jerusalem, you find Shimei, who is not a friend. He just says, well, serves you right. Do you have friends like that? You get into trouble? Yeah, serves you right. Well, he wasn't a friend. Hushai was. He's described as David's friend. And he risked everything to speak up for David to Absalom. And then there's Barzillai that we thought about before, who cared, who showed kindness and generosity in bringing food and supplies. He was sharing, if you like, in David's experience and David's <laughs> distress. <clears throat> and if you've no idea what all that what I was talking about there, read 2 Samuel chapters 15 to 19. Again, spend a little less time on your phone or whatever else. Why not read some chapters of scripture? It'll do you more good. <clears throat> so friendship is based, is an association based on something shared. Maybe a shared activity, a shared experience or interest. It's a connection with someone, isn't it? So that we understand them. And and there's affection. It's not just we understand them, we like them. There's loyalty, there's support, there's help, there's kindness. With a friend, there's a sort of sense that they're on your side. If you like, it's the opposite of an enemy. And of course, friendship can be at lots of levels. We shouldn't be, it doesn't all have to be sort of of one sort of type. You can have friendships that are very deep and very long-lasting, but you can also have friendships that are more superficial and brief, and that's not wrong. The same word um, is used in Proverbs for for both what is translated as neighbor and also as friend. It's talking about someone that you associate with. Maybe you're close in location, a neighbor. Maybe you're close in heart, more as we would call a friend. But not every friendship has to be as deep as that between David and Jonathan. It doesn't have to be that deep to be precious. Friendships are voluntary, and they can come and go as circumstances change. In other words, it's different to family. See, family is fixed, isn't it? It's not your choice. And you are not necessarily close emotionally to everyone in your family. You may or may not get on. But being family doesn't depend on how well you get on. It's a different sort of relationship. You may have a friend who is closer than a brother. And that also means that friendship is not the same as marriage. I hope there's plenty of overlap between friendship and marriage. You know, marriage includes friendship, but it's not the same thing as friendship. I hope there is understanding and kindness and love in marriage, but it is a different type of relationship. For one thing, marriage is something public. It's something recognized by society. It is is a, a covenant you enter into before witnesses. It is something permanent. You don't drift into and out of marriage. And it's a union of people, where now new life has the potential to be created. New image of God to be created. There's a new unit created in marriage. And even just saying those things, it makes me realize just how countercultural simply saying that is. What I've just said there about marriage is totally different to what most people, if you ask them about marriage today, what they would think. But this is God's universe, and that's what he says. Or to put it a different way around, friendship is not sexual. There's not a verse in Proverbs for this because it's so obvious, because it's God's universe. It's assumed. Sex belongs in male-female marriage alone. David was one in spirit with Jonathan, not one in body. And again, that is so countercultural, isn't it? It means that Friendship is not friends. Think of the TV show. The one thing that that show is not is friendship by a biblical understanding. There, they sleep with each other. You have these these continually changing relationships. Friendship, according to the Bible, is not friends. We're in God's universe. And whether you like it or not, it is the universe we inhabit, 
And in that universe, sex does not make or cement a friendship. In fact, it destroys them. That has implications for how we, we even use the sort of terminology, I think, of boyfriend, girlfriend. That is actually not some sort of precursor to marriage. It's something actually rather different. It changes how we understand same-sex relationships. Friendships are protected. They are precious precisely by being non-sexual. And I think as churches, we need to be aware of this. We can be so focused on affirming marriage that we don't also value friendship as something a little bit distinct. And in particular, valuing same-sex friendship. That is something good. That is something positive. That is something to be encouraged. Same-sex friendships is made by God. The problem is when we start to make it something sexual. That isn't what God's pattern for friendship is. So, friendship made. It's made by God. Okay? It's God's universe. It's God's idea. Friendship is not our idea. It's not just a pragmatic way to survive life. Friendship is actually part of being the image of God. I showed a diagram in the um, Bible study we did a couple of weeks ago that's sort of trying to show our identity as, as people made as God's image. And, and part of the key thing is that we are connected to other people. We are made social. We are made for relationship. Think of it like this. Humans are like Velcro. Okay? We keep making connections. We, we're sticky. We stick to each other. We, we constantly are making friendships of one sort or another. They may be, you know, it might just be a, a training day at work. You make a friendship that you almost never meet the person again, but there's a friendship for that day. The other friendships can be more permanent or bigger or whatever. But we are always making these connections. We are bits of Velcro, making connection with other bits of Velcro. Think of that castaway film with, uh, with Tom Hanks. He was so desperate for friendship that he makes an imaginary friend out of that volleyball, doesn't he? Uh, called Wilson, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, why? It's because it's how we're made. It is not good for man to be alone. In other words, community is assumed. Again, this is so countercultural. It is not the individualism of Western culture. Our Western culture says you are self sufficient as an individual. It's about your own self optimization. If others are involved, it's for your self fulfillment. The focus is on yourself. And as that, that quote on the sheet shows, that is actually what leads to loneliness and insecurity. God's universe, the world of Proverbs, is different. It assumes a connection with people and a responsibility for people. He who despises his neighbor sins, but blessed is he who is kind to the needy. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later. I'll give it to you tomorrow when you have it with you now. You see, we have a responsibility for one another. And in fact, to live in that way stops loneliness. It actually gives security. As we depend on others for care, we need one another. So there's a sense in which it's actually good to have lots of friends. But we are limited in the number of close friends we can have. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. If you like, there's a greater value on close friendships. And why is that? Because we are creatures. In other words, we are limited. It takes time and a lot of energy, actually, to maintain strong relationships. There is a limit to how many people you can know well. You can't know everyone. You can't keep up with every friend. We need to accept that. Loyalty does not mean keeping every friendship permanently. That's impossible. It's actually far better to invest in current friendships, to have deeper relationships. You see, social media gives the illusion of being free of our creaturely limitations. You know, you don't need to be in the same place to communicate. 
But on its own, that will only create thin relationships. Proximity matters. Better a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. Physical closeness matters because we are physical people. If you want a C in this list, you can have the word corporeal, but I thought physical might be a bit simpler to follow. Um, we are physical people with bodies. Look how, this, how Moses' relationship with God is described. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with a friend. What does that assume about friendship? Isn't that interesting? So you get the same idea in, in the second and third letter of John, where he says, well, okay, we, I'm communicating by letter, that, that'll sort of have to do, but face-to-face is really what we want it to be. And isn't that something we learn in the pandemic? You know, Zoom is great, but it's not the same as physical, is it? And our bodies do limit us. We can't be in two places at once. But it's how we're made. And it makes for better friendships. It is very hard to make deep friends online if there is no other connection. And you can never be friends with a chatbot. It's not a person. It's just electrons moving around. And actually, here's another application. TV personalities. I'm always struck by when sometimes, you know, TV personalities or film stars die. People sort of say, oh, I feel like I've lost a friend. That is nonsense. That is an utter illusion. You know, there's people on a screen in your home and you think they're there with you. They're not. You know, remember, they can't see you. You know, the, 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 the child's um, you know, misunderstanding, people on a screen, oh, they can see me. No, they can't. They don't know you. You don't know them. Often people are very different off screen. Whatever else TV personalities are, they are not your friends. And yet, many people live their lives as if they are. You need a body for communication. And this is the other key element in friendship. You see, we reflect as the image of God, a God who speaks. Friendship relies on communication. And that means there are an awful lot of proverbs that are relevant to friendship more than those than just doing a word search for friend. Okay, all the proverbs on speech are very relevant for friendship. That's why it's good to read through the whole book of proverbs, why they're all jumbled up. We actually, they all interrelate. And you'd think that today we would be sorted on this, wouldn't we, the communication thing? It's just so easy to communicate. But easy communication doesn't mean better communication. And I think we've all experienced that, haven't we, in the frustration of, why don't they respond? You know, they didn't answer my question or whatever. Or they've misunderstood again. You know, texting can be okay, can't it? It it can be helpful to confirm arrangements, something very simple, something factual. But it's a pretty terrible way to communicate. Sometimes I've been on these sort of long exchanges on WhatsApp where you've got these messages going backwards and forwards. And it's a terrible way to communicate, really, in in a sort of a a conversation. If you just picked up the phone and talked to someone, there would be far less misunderstanding. Half the WhatsApp conversation is people misunderstanding what you've just said or not getting the tone of what you just said or whatever it is. Talking together, even on a phone, is so much better. And if you can have two bodies together, that's even better still because we communicate so much with our bodies. We can hide so much, even behind a voice. You can tell so much, can't you, sometimes, just seeing someone walk in a room. And the medium that we use changes the message. Twitter has its uses, blogs have their uses, but you can't communicate everything in a few lines. It's going to change how you discuss things. WhatsApp groups, they are not the same as one-to-one communication. Effectively, it's, it's, like having a communica- it's like having a conversation with spectators, which is actually a very strange thing. Imagine you know, talking to someone and having a whole load of people all around you staring at you while you're talking to someone. Well, that's really what's going on in a WhatsApp group. It's very strange. 
And I think it changes what it is then appropriate to say. True friendship involves words. And sometimes correcting words. Wounds, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of one's friend springs from his earnest counsel. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Again, isn't that just so countercultural? Wounds from a friend, correction, a friend saying, You are wrong. Oh, you can't say that. That that's, um, goes against all sorts of uh, things today, doesn't it? Well, if you can't say what's wrong, you're not going to have friendship. Because true friendship involves correction and rebuke. And that earnest counsel, it comes from having the other person's interests at heart. Not your own. There's a stimulation that comes from others, the idea that you can learn from someone else. So often, part, part of the problem with so much electronic communication is it's so focused on what we are giving out. It's focused on us talking and trying to have as big an audience for our wonderful thoughts as, as we can. Whereas actually true biblical wisdom is shutting up and listening. You see, to give, right, to give wise, um, correcting counsel, you need to know someone. And to know someone, you need to listen. To understand them, you need to listen. And again, it's one of these things, everyone thinks they're a good listener. 99.9% .9 of us are rubbish listeners. We're far better at talking. We're very bad at, we're very bad at listening when we're not, we don't really want to hear what the other person is saying. When perhaps it is something that is actually very important to the other person. Read Proverbs. Our listening skills are so important. Holding our tongue can be the greatest source of wisdom. We need to communicate. And if you like, what we've already done there is shown sort of how we don't do these things. Friendship is broken. And really, this is what Proverbs assumes, isn't it? It assumes sin. It's, most of the Proverbs are about things going wrong. So God made friendship, but we've messed it up. And sin is really trying to make God's universe my universe. Trying to make God's universe serve me. It's sort of trying to rig the system to benefit me. So, so if like God set up the system, we're trying to sort of rig it so that it can benefit me. That's really what sin is. We're trying to manipulate and control. And as we do that, we will abuse friendship to get what we want, to have the benefits but not the costs. That's what we will try and do. That's what sin is like. It's very unattractive, but it's in all of us. And as a result, friendship can hurt rather than bless. Friends can be a bad influence. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. The character of friends matters. Yes, we are all sinful, but some are more dangerous. Some sins and some people are more dangerous than others, and it's some, to some extent this depends on who you are. I think it's a bad idea to surround yourself with people who are too similar to you in what they are struggling with. And yet that is often what can bring people together, isn't it? If you're struggling with addiction or eating disorders or a love of money or whatever it is, surrounding yourself with people struggling with the same things is probably a very, is, 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 it is a bad idea. That is where a connection is an unhelpful thing. And you see, the problem is not, in a sense, other people. The problem is ourselves. We are so sinful that we are shaped by others for the worse. That's the real problem. It's not, in a sense, other people. It's the fact that I'm so sinful that I get influenced by that. Money breaks friendships. It distorts friendships. You'll find many proverbs are about loans and, um, and the danger of them. And we can't go into this now, but you need, to, you need to understand those commands in the context of the whole life of Old Testament Israel. 
it doesn't mean that it is always wrong to, to, to have a loan or something like that. But, but the warning is that there are dangers with it. And it's really about power. You get a power imbalance between the debtor and the creditor, the one who owes and the one who gives. And that sort of power imbalance applies in lots of ways, doesn't it, in friendships? We see that applied today, don't we? How someone in a position of power or influence can use that in a way that distorts a friendship. So that could be through money, but it could also be through other things, through opportunities they're able to give. Just think of some of the things that have been in the news recently. Distorts friendships, power and money. And look at this one. Wealth brings many friends, but a poor man's friends desert him. There's a loneliness in being poor, but I think you're even more lonely if you're rich. Because who's your real friend? Think of how people will flock to a rich person. Why are they coming to you? Is it because they love you or they love your money? Who are your real friends? There's an awful loneliness in riches. Crazy how we sort of hanker after it. It's a miserable life being really rich. Horrendous loneliness, I think, in that. Beware. Words. We use words not only to communicate, but to control. Flattery. Whoever flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his feet. Flattery is manipulation. You are getting what you want out of a friend by being nice to them, flattering them. It's not about their good. It's about what you can get out of them. Gossip. A perverse man stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends. Using words to cast others in a bad light so that you can look better. Betraying confidences. That is hugely damaging to friendship. Friendship is built on trust. So we need to be super careful in an age where it is so easy to share information. And in churches, we've got to be aware of this. You know, prayer requests are a great way to cloak uh, gossip in something that sounds okay. Be really careful. Our, don't ever think of our data protection policy either as some sort of just bit of administrative, legal, pointless paper. Here's a sentence in it. Passing on information about people inappropriately is a serious sin. Do you ever talk about that sin? Well, that's a sin too, and I think that is in line with what we find in Proverbs. We need to think about what information is shared. Lying destroys relationships too, doesn't it? We've seen that again. And finally, thoughtlessness. A lack of care. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house. Too much of you and he will hate you. Now, I think this is a great example of a proverb that has many applications beyond the literal setting your foot in a neighbor's house. I think it applies actually to this stuff about words. Oversharing. I think older generations have tended to be more private, be a bit more guarded in what they will share. The younger generation today, it's very much about you share anything and everything. And there's certain aspects to that that I think can be helpful. But is it always helpful? You know, do, do I actually need to know that? Does everyone need to know that? Or this sort of application, you know, every problem, you go to your neighbor's house. We have a sort of a culture that is lacking in resilience. We think, if we have a problem, there should be someone there that comes along to sort it out for me. Not in God's universe. There is personal responsibility. You can put too much dependence on a friend. For every problem, no, don't just go to someone else to fix it. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house is where you can see you need a bit of time to reflect on how these proverbs work. If a, if a man loudly blesses his neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. Well, I used to do that as a postman in the days when you had the post arriving really early on a Saturday morning. 
So I'd, I'd love banging on the door really loudly and being super cheery when people are coming down. <laughs> so, what's all this? <laughs> but um, th again, there's a wider application than this. We can be tone deaf emotionally, can't we? And again, it's where the focus is on myself. It's not about what the other person needs and feels. It's not putting yourself in the other person's shoes. It's just about you. And what about this one? Like a madman shooting firebrands or deadly arrows is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. Again, it's thoughtless. It's very easy to excuse sin by making it into a joke. And I think this is something, a particular problem in UK culture, where it is seen as really important to have a sense of humor. If you don't have a sense of humor, that's a really bad thing. So in other words, if you can make a joke out of something, you can get away with it. If you can make a joke about being drunk or being cruel to someone or defrauding them, then what ordinarily people would sort of be shocked at is actually okay. Oh, you've made a joke about it. So there's lots of ways that friendship can be spoiled. You see, friendship is a bit complicated, isn't it? And the lesson is this. Friends will let you down. And you will let down friends. So don't make friendship, however precious it is, don't make it the ultimate, the biggest thing in your life. Don't find your identity, your worth in friends. Don't look for your happiness just in friends because it can't deliver. Like a bad tooth or a lame foot is reliance on the unfaithful in times of trouble. Many a man claims to have unfailing love, but a faithful man who can find. You see the problem. Who is faithful? Who is faithful always, totally? There isn't always a friend who sticks closer than a brother. They'll let you down. So where do we go with this? Proverbs is not self-help. If you like, the message this morning is not, um, is not ultimately be a better friend. The whole point is we can't do that ourselves. It is not self-help. The message is this. Remember, you are in God's universe. So let's go to the God who made friendship. That's where we can find friendship restored. Abraham was called a friend of God three times in the scripture. God is never called anyone's friend. See the difference? Abraham is a friend of God, but you don't say God is my friend. The one place actually where that is said, Jeremiah 3 verse 4, it is saying that it is wrong to do so. Why? Because God is not your equal. God is not your mate. And yet, God has all the qualities of a perfect friend. He is faithful and honest, understanding, caring. He is near. It was right to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. We're expressing something true about God. And Jesus had lots of friends. Lots of people saw Jesus as their friend, someone on their side. He was the friend of sinners. The disciples were friends, and some were closer than others. Jesus was not equally friendly with everyone. He was closer, it seems, to Peter, James, and John, for example, amongst the disciples. That is not wrong. And yet, those disciples were not good friends to him. They were asleep. They ran away in his hour of need. When he needed them most, angels had to, had to come and help, help Jesus because his disciples were so rubbish. Peter denied he even knew Jesus. You see, they weren't very good friends. And Jesus, knowing all that, said this before he was crucified. Greater love has no one than this than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I mean, that's what shows you it's not a relationship of equals. Jesus isn't your mate. 
No, no, you do what he commands. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. Jesus goes to lay down his life for them and for all who will trust in him. He will pay for their sin. And in doing so, restore that broken friendship, that broken relationship. Jesus can promise to be with you forever. And when you come to him and when you trust him, you are part of a family, part of the church. And strikingly, the epistles that most frequently address the church as friends, so it's Peter and John's epistles, actually. James didn't write an epistle because he was killed too early. The other James we have is the brother of Jesus. Interesting, their friendship with Jesus, did that colour how they viewed their friendship with the church? Because if you are friends with Jesus, you are friends with Jesus' friends. And if you're not friends with Jesus' friends, you're not friends with Jesus. So if we lived out the friendship of Proverbs, the friendship we see in Jesus, we truly would be a friendly church. Every church thinks they're a friendly church. But are we? Do we reflect the friendship of Jesus? Does Jesus count you as his friend? Let's finish with this final hymn that speaks of the great friendship of Jesus in how he has come to to save us from our sin. Verse 6 here, here we go. None but Jesus can do helpless sinners good. We we sung this at the Lord's Supper a month ago. And um, so if you were there, then you'll recognize the meaty tune that goes with this. But this, um, this, I think, is just so precious, what we see in Jesus. So let's stand and sing.
down. <clears throat> Let's pray. None but Jesus can do helpless sinners good. What a glorious statement. We thank you that in Jesus we have the saviour that we need, the friend that we need. And we pray that we would humble ourselves and we would come to him today. We would trust him and we would want to walk with him all our days and learn from him what it means to be a true friend. And we ask this in his name. Amen. <clears throat>